Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Clyde and I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and it's such a delight to be back with the Northern California gang again. I've had the pleasure of attending quite a few of your conference sessions that I love. And it's so good to see some old friends here, too. Especially Helen. I haven't seen her for ages. I, uh, I say I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous rather than just an alcoholic for two reasons that I think are important. Number one, to remind me of the responsibility declaration. I am responsible. When anyone, anywhere, reaches out for help, I want the hand of AA always to be there. And for that, I am responsible. Also, just to be an alcoholic isn't too difficult. I'm not very smart, and I made it. Uh, in fact, we have to practically uh, prove we're nuts to join this outfit. <laughs> and then we join and get active and do something a little crazy and people are horrified. However, uh, there are millions of alcoholics out there that have never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am among many who, for the first several years around Alcoholics Anonymous, had no outside contact. Almost everyone I knew was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Those uh, outside AA had long since written me off and wanted nothing to do with me. But I got the feeling after a couple of three years that everybody knew about Alcoholics Anonymous and that almost everybody worthwhile was a member. And uh, I often repeated something I'd heard, that alcoholics are just uh, a little above the average in IQ. Of course, it was always an alcoholic that said that. <laughs> but uh, I had come to believe it because I heard it said so often. But I had been uh, pretty well a low-bottom drunk. I'm not going into a drunk log but a doctor came to see me I was sleeping in a garage. A friend of mine had fixed a cot in his garage for me. And I was about to die, and I knew it. And I didn't much care about that. I had unsuccessfully tried suicide a couple of times in these depressions. But I suddenly had a tremendous desire to die sober. And I think for the first time in my life, I honestly asked for help. And the doctor who came told me there was nothing medical science could do for a guy like me. He called me a drunk, which I was. But he said, if you really want to be sober, I've heard of an outfit over in North Hollywood called Alcoholics Anonymous. They might be able to help you. And he got the address of that group for me. And I went there, attended my first meeting uh, at the North Hollywood Beginners Group. And I think I shall never forget it. I, I hope I never do. I was, as many of you, so despondent, so discouraged, uh, so remorseful, so resentful, so sick. And I walked into that clubhouse, and I'd hardly gotten through the door until dozens of people had come up and shaken my hand and told me they were glad to see me. Now, no one had been glad to see me anywhere for a long time, and I, I knew I didn't have anything these people could want, but I don't recall that I puzzled too long over why they were glad to see me. I just wanted to know if they could really do, as the doctor said, help me stay sober. And as the meeting started, a good deal like this one did, uh, the man leading the meeting made an explanation of the sickness of alcoholism as a twofold illness. And he called it an obsession of the mind coupled with an allergy of the body. And he said this, Mental obsession is something we can't seem to control, that we'll get sober, go on the wagon, and for some emotional reason, some great emotional thing happens, our mother dies, or we break a shoestring, uh, some emotional upheaval, we take a drink. 
Once we take one drink, it seems to set up within us uh, a physical compulsion for another and another over which we're powerless. And you know, as he, as he said that, I thought back just in seconds, I believe, uh, I was able to remember uh, a thing that happened to me well, shortly before I was 21. I had been sort of a weekend drunk since I was about 16. And I started going with a girl who didn't drink, and her mother didn't want her to go with fellows who drank. And uh, so I quit drinking in order to have dates with her. There was something more important than drinking for me. And uh, we had several dates, only double dating with her sister and her boyfriend. And, and my ideas required no other couple around. And so I beamed my thinking for several weeks at arranging a date with this gal all alone. <clears throat> I finally arranged such a date. It was to have been the Saturday before Easter in 1930. This is clear in my mind. And I got all dressed up in my new Easter outfit, and just before I left my room to keep this important date, I gargled a mouthful of Listerine to be sure my breath wouldn't offend, and I gagged and swallowed that stuff. Now, I thought it was poison. And boy, I had an important date. I didn't want to get sick or die or anything, I, so I quickly read the label of the bottle to find the antidote. And by the time I'd read that whole label, at the bottom it says 25% alcohol, I'd begun to feel it. I remember I had the most pleasant feeling, nice little glow, and I felt exactly the way I'd always wanted to feel every time I drank. I didn't drink to get drunk, I drank to feel good. And I looked in the mirror, and my God, I, I saw I looked just like Richard Dix. <laughs> and I thought, my God, I could have been drinking this stuff all along. This girl and her mother wouldn't have smelled anything bad about me, and I'd felt just like I wanted to feel, so I drank the rest of the Listerine. <laughs> and I came to four days later in jail. I started my first blacked-out drunk when I accidentally swallowed a fluid containing alcohol. When getting drunk was the last thing in my mind. When I had the best reason I'd ever had in my life to stay sober, I got drunk. That all went through my mind when this man talked about this physical compulsion, this inability to control what happened after one drink. Right then and there, I believe now that I took the first step of this program. I knew I was an alcoholic. Now I had the answer to why so many times. I had tried to stay sober and had failed. That was the first inkling I had, as smart as I thought I was, that it wasn't the tenth drink or the brand that got me drunk. It was a first stinking drink. And all I had to do, I learned, was to not take the first drink and I wouldn't get drunk. So simple. Well, that's about all I've done over the years. It's been a little over 23 and a half years ago that I attended that first meeting, and I have not had a drink since then. I never did take pills. I never heard about pills until after I got to AA, and I heard enough about them in AA that I want no part of them. So all I've contributed, really, is a willingness to try. And in that willingness to try, I have had some experience that I would like to share with you. This is billed as a general service meeting, I am certainly no authority on general service. I have had some experience in it, which I would like to share with you. But I think a definition of service to me is important. And actually, that's all AA is, is a service. The service of carrying this message to someone else who wants it. The first service I, I had performed on me was that meeting where those people there shared with me their ways of staying sober so that I, too, could be sober. I, uh, I went to meetings quite regularly, and I was told if I really wanted this program, the best way to get it was to get on my feet and talk about it. And so I tried. And, oh, I was nervous. I, I would just shook so bad my head ached. And... Uh, I'm reminded of a professional speaker I heard recently said, uh, when you first get up to start speaking, most people sort of have butterflies. And after many years of speaking, he still had butterflies, but 
he taught them to fly in formation. <laughs> I think that's what we do in AA. And uh, so my butterflies, uh, uh, most of the time, are in formation. Occasionally one gets out a little bit. But I would get on my feet and try to talk, and about all I could say was my name, how many days I'd been sober, and then I'd bawl. And the harder I tried, the more I cried. And, uh, oh, for several years, I was known around San Fernando Valley as Blubbering Davis. <laughs> and uh, I think I do have one distinction in AA. Uh, there's, there's very few of us that are distinctive in, in a fellowship like this. But in our part of the country, at least, I'm known as the only one who's ever cried more than Chuck C. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Quite a distinction. However, uh, some growth has occurred. I've been known to get through a whole meeting without crying here once in a while. And uh, if I'm lucky, I might do it today even. But I like something, uh, in fact, I like everything Dave said last night at the meeting. But I especially got a kick out of his comment about passing the baskets before the speaker. <laughs> and uh, those of you who came in late, the baskets have already been passed. Drop your money in the basket on the way out. <laughs> That's not the sole purpose of the meeting, but it's an important part of it. Well, I stayed around close to AA members, and I followed the advice, don't worry about the newcomer who's trying to get sober until you get yourself good and sober. In the meantime, grab the coattails of those around you who are sober and appear to be happy about it. So I grabbed myself some old-timers' coattails, and I began to learn and then I picked up some literature, and about the only literature we had in those days, early 46, were some reprints of articles Bill had written in the grapevine. They were something talking about traditions. And I got these pamphlets, and I read them and studied them. And I went back to my group at North Hollywood and tried to talk to some of the old-timers there. Uh, Great White Father, we called him, the guy who founded the group. And he told me that as a newcomer, I should shut up and listen. I was too new at this thing to tell them anything, and I better learn something before I popped off. Well, I went home and read these pamphlets some more. And in those pamphlets, Bill told me about guys like that. And I, <laughs> I went back and told him off, good. <laughs> and he still told me to shut up and listen. In the meantime, uh, Kent, who'd been leading all the beginners' meetings, uh, told me one night, to say, I'm going on location after a while. Would you like to conduct one of the beginners' meetings while I'm gone? And I said, sure, I would. This was a chance to be of service to my group, to lead a meeting. And oh, did I want to lead a meeting. I, I felt I could do it so much better than some of those old-timers. They've been sober so damn long, they forgot what it was like to be drunk, you know. And if they just let me do it, and here was my chance. So I rushed right home after the meeting and started preparing to lead the meeting. And about six months went by, and nobody asked me to lead a meeting. Others led in his place, but not me. I got pretty resentful. I got so resentful that in addition to my book, I gathered up a coffee pot, and I started my own meeting over at Burbank so I could lead it. <laughs> and I understand that's how group number two started in the first place. Somebody didn't like the way group number one was going. And I'll promise you, I got rid of my resentment real quick. Uh, they say you can't keep a resentment and, and sobriety together. And I believe that. But one thing that helped me get rid of that resentment of those North Hollywood people of not letting me lead a meeting was the fact that 76 of them showed up to help us have our first meeting in Burbank. I learned later they were so glad to get rid of me, they wanted to be sure the meeting was a success. <laughs> uh, I guess that's not really true. But there was an introduction to further service. The, the service of helping a group, being secretary, seeing to it that the meeting hall was ready, that literature was there for newcomers, that a speaker was arranged, that refreshments were available. That's group service. Someone has to do it. You simply can't announce there's going to be a meeting and everybody show up and expect something to happen. Somebody has to be delegated the chores of arranging for a group meeting. 
And that happened to be my chore with that group. Then I learned about another phase of service. As secretary of a new group, uh, and I wore my title founder very well, uh, I thought, uh, I was invited to become a member of the L.A. Central Committee. At that time, our central office was operated by a committee composed of a member from every group in the area that wanted to participate. So the first central committee meeting I attended, there were 120 of us in the room. My group was number 120 in that area, and you can imagine 120 people sitting in a room trying to conduct a business meeting. You probably remember on, on one of the earlier slide films of GSO when it's talking about preparing our literature. Imagine if you can, 15 people sitting down discussing one page of what's in our literature, the hassling that can occur. Well, our central committee meetings developed into personality clashes galore. Our secretary went ahead and ran the office in spite of his committee. But I took special exception to one member of that committee, a loudmouthed ex-trombone player, and uh, <laughs> I hated the very sight of him, and he didn't think much more of me on first sight. We, we took a strong dislike to each other. I learned later that I disliked him because he was an old-timer by the definition, when you've been sober long enough for some newcomer to resent it, you're an old-timer. <laughs> I was a newcomer, and he'd been sober almost to the day, five years ahead of me, and I resented that. I didn't know it then, but I learned it later. But he and I got into some pretty severe clashes, and he, he got up in an open meeting and announced that that guy Davis is no alcoholic, he's not old enough, he hasn't drank enough, uh, he shouldn't be here. Well, I'm of the opinion that... When you come to AA looking for help, you've drank long enough. You've drank hard enough. I don't care if it's only been a few days. You've had it in your opinion, and that's all that matters. And I had had it in my opinion. So I didn't take his advice. I didn't leave. I stayed. But I got a little more upset. So I sat down and I dreamed up a letter to the Central Committee it was about five pages long, and it detailed the way this guy was failing to adhere to the steps and the traditions and why he should be kicked out of the fellowship for the good of the movement. <laughs> I had an unbeatable case. <laughs> and just before I mailed the letter, I called my sponsor. I wanted him to be the first to read this masterpiece. So my sponsor came over, and he read my letter, and he sat there, it seemed like a half an hour, looking at me, and finally he said, you wrote yourself a letter, didn't you, bud? <laughs> you know I had? That was my first written inventory. <laughs> Everything that I'd accused this wonderful old-timer of were things wrong with me. That's how I learned the true meaning of the thing I'd heard so often. Remember, when you point the finger at somebody, there's three pointing back at you. And so I took that inventory to heart. And I've since written my inventory frequently. That is a service that was performed for me by my fellows in AA. To show me the hard way, and I learned everything the hard way, how to take my inventory. Well, obviously, I never mailed the letter. And next thing I got involved in was reorganizing our central office. Uh, I'm an administrator. That's my business. Uh, and uh, work simplification is, is a way of life with me. And the way this thing was going was terrible. So I mapped out a reorganization structure to cut our area up into districts, have little meetings within the districts, and all the district uh, chairmen would then become a central committee. And I submitted that, and oh, the furor. Then a lot of people joined this other old-timer and wanted to kick me out of the fellowship. <laughs> but then I withdrew from the committee. I'd served my term, and I became just a member of my group and tried to do 12-step work one thing or another. And a couple of years later, about 1949, the central committee 
adopted what they call a zoning plan. They divided our area up into zones rather than districts, and each zone chairman became a member of the Central Committee. And that has worked over the years very well. Now, I don't claim that I did it, but the point is that they don't do anything in AA. You and I do things in AA. And we have a saying around the Burbank group, and many groups, I guess, have. If you see something that needs doing, do it. If it's good, everybody will join and help you do it. If it's bad, they'll soon stop you. But if you think it needs doing, don't sit around waiting for them to do it. Because service isn't they, service is you, me. Well, that was uh, another little learning curve I had. And I was able to finally get over the resentment that I didn't get credit for the reorganization. I've talked about it enough over the years that I'm sure everybody knows I dreamed it up. <laughs> That's certainly one thing. Modesty is, is uh, no commodity of mine. And uh, maybe someday I'll have some of it. But on the other hand... Remembering some of these things and learning about them is helpful to me because if I don't know what went on in the past, how am I going to possibly take a rightful part of the present and help guide the future? And that's the thing with the third legacy plan, the plan of general service. Uh, I, I digress a little. Let me backtrack and, and take my service experience more in chronological order. After... Uh, having dropped out of, of Central Committee, having served my term there, Bill and Dr. Bob came out to L.A. in 1947. And Dr. Bob gave us a wonderful AA message, and Bill talked to us at some length about something called Third Legacy. And most of us didn't know what he was talking about, mostly because we didn't know what the first and second legacies were. <laughs> and we found out that the first legacy was the AA book, The Program of Personal Recovery. <clears throat> this was given to us freely by those who went before so that we, too, could find recovery. The second legacy was the legacy of unity embodied in the 12 traditions, taken out of our group experience, given to us freely to help us solve our problems. And the third legacy, then, was the legacy of general service. Worldwide service. Service that up until then had been conducted for us by a board of trustees, mostly non-alcoholics, and advised by Bill and Bob as our co-founders. And in 1950, it was known that Dr. Bob was mortally ill. And Bill was panicked, as rightly he should have been, because he was perishable too. And if this board of trustees back in New York or to make some serious blunder that could affect AA around the world, how in the world could AA survive? That board had to have the advice of AA members. We had to guide our own destiny, and how to do that was the problem. So with the help of one of our most dedicated non-alcoholic friends, Mr. Bernie Smith, a very prominent corporation lawyer in New York, who's been a long-time friend of AA, served on our board all these years, he developed the Third Legacy Service Structure, and Bill went around the country stumping for it. And in 1950, when Bill came out to, to watch us have our first delegate election, I was one of the committee members in attendance, and uh, down in Los Angeles, we're different, uh, we all had the Third Legacy Manual pointing out, here's the proper procedure to do it, and the way they'd done it in many areas of the country successfully. You First, you out of your committee members, you elect your officers, and then you elect your delegate. So we're different. We first elected our delegate. Everybody left their name on the board to be delegate. After the delegate election, now comes the officers. Nobody wanted their name on the board. Well, we finally got some officers in here. I'm happy to say that down there in L.A. area, we're just about to follow Third Legacy procedure. <laughs> After 18 years, we have elected a chairman, 
and it's my privilege to be serving currently as chairman of our committee. We have a delegate, we have an alternate delegate, we have a treasurer, we have a secretary. And uh, we did that last November. I understand the uh, Northern California Coastal Panel did that last January, and I, uh, I'm happy to learn that the Interior Panel just did it last September. Now that leaves the Southern Coastal Panel as the renegade. Maybe we'll get to them, too, and maybe California will have finally joined AA. <laughs> However, back to this thing. Uh, Cliff W. was elected our delegate the first time, and Cliff came back after that first General Service Conference in 51 to tell us this beautiful story of this AA 12-step around the world. Things most of us had never heard about. Most of us just took for granted. Oh, we had an AA book, we had AA literature, all these things. We just took them for granted. We didn't stop to wonder and think about where they came from. I had learned through reading Bill's articles that the first general service performed for us was the publication of the AA book in 1939. This board of trustees was set up in 1938. The right thing for the wrong reason. This often happens in AA. Bill was trying to get the existing groups to send a little money into New York to support this office he was trying to run. And the Alkies out there weren't going to send any money to another drunk. They just didn't know whether he was going to go out and get drunk with their money. And they weren't about to send him money. So he got some of his non-alcoholic friends, well-known prominent people, to serve on the board of trustees on the theory that perhaps alcoholics would send money to non-alcoholics. And it worked. They did. A little. So it was really the right thing for the wrong reason. Because those non-alcoholics who served on our board have been the most dedicated people in the world. I've heard it said so often from an AA podium that those non-alcoholics out there, those earth people, don't understand. In my experience, those non-alcoholics out there understand only too well. I had a couple of wives that understood me damn well. <laughs> and they left in fairly short order. I had to choose between them and the bottle, and I chose the bottle. I've since learned that was a good decision at the time. <laughs> in fact, I think that's one of the things I have to be grateful for in AA. Uh, all of us are fond of saying I'm a grateful member of AA. One of the things I'm grateful for, I've never yet had to pay, take back an ex-wife. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, Cliff told us all about this thing, and we began to learn, but the attendance at our meetings wasn't very good. So after the 52 conference, Cliff put it to us committee members, how are we going to get this message of service across, across to the average AA member in our area? So I said, hey, Cliff, why don't we have a, a conference in the LA area to talk about just services? Great. Go back to your groups and ask them if they'd like to do that. And at our next meeting, we'll see what happens. So we went back to our groups and asked them, and in fact, all the groups, uh, that was a great idea. So the next committee meeting, I was a little bit late arriving, and Cliff was out in the hall, pacing up and down. He said, hey, come here. If we take this thing up today and, and the groups want it, will you be chairman? Well, I, right quick, I wasn't thinking about what he was talking about, but I heard chairman. I said, yes. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm always willing to chair a meeting because I can do it so well, you know. <laughs> so come to find out, it was this question of an L.A. conference talk about service, and overwhelmingly the groups wanted it. So uh, that's how I got to be chairman of the first Southern California Convention. It wasn't first a convention, though. It was an L.A. area conference. So I went out into the various parts of L.A., contacted people whom I knew were workers, and formed a committee. And we announced uh, our first committee meeting. And at that committee meeting, we had people from San Diego, from San Bernardino, from Santa Maria, from Paso Robles, and Bakersfield. So before our first committee meeting, our L.A. area conference became a Southern California affair. Well, that was how I got involved in that service. I opened my damn big mouth with a suggestion that they liked. So if you suggest something that's good, you'll probably be made chairman to get it done. 
That's been my experience. And uh, that isn't too bad to start with, because the first time something starts, it's going to have to be somebody that believes in it, otherwise it won't go. Well, about that time, too, I wasn't making too much money then. I was so busy running around in AA, I didn't have time to devote to my job, and I was I was losing jobs or changing jobs pretty often. And uh, I would make 12-step calls, and I'd always take a book along, and, and uh, I was losing more books, and they were pretty expensive. And I got to thinking, by golly, if, if I had a, some little cheap pamphlet, uh, hey, our A literature, if we only had the 12 steps and 12 conditions in that literature, it wouldn't cost me so much when I leave these things at a 12-step call. So I talked to my group about it at a business meeting. And they thought it was a good idea. So I took it to the district meeting and talked to the GSRs from the other groups in the district. Told them my idea of, of having the 12 steps and 12 traditions in all the literature. They thought it was a good idea. So I took it on to our assembly committee. The committee agreed, and Cliff, our delegate, took it back to the 52 conference. The General Service Conference thought it was a good idea. And since 1953... All of our conference-approved literature has contained the short form of the 12 steps and 12 petitions. Now, all because I was too damn cheap to give away books. <laughs> the right thing for the wrong reason again. But it, it worked. But this is an example of how we each, as individuals, have a stake in what happens within Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, this meeting itself, this is an AA meeting. Down in our area, maybe up here too, I don't know, people say, oh, general service, ah, oh, I want a regular AA meeting. This is AA, in total. This is what AA is all about. Without general service, there would be no AA to start with. As I say, that first general service was publishing the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Without that book, most of us wouldn't be sober or even alive. Our general service board did that for us. Then over the years, with Bill and Bob's advice, the board continued to make good decisions. Well, with Bill and Bob gone, now what? Okay, now what? With the third legacy plan in operation, with the delegates from the various areas meeting with the board to advise the board, AA continues to progress along the lines the members of AA want it to. This is the implication to me of this responsibility declaration. You and I, the members of Alcoholics Anonymous, are responsible for whether or not this program is available to those millions yet unborn that will need it as bad or badly as we did. It was here for me when I got ready for it. Someone had prepared the way for me. Someone did a lot of work. Now it's up to me to repay that. And it's up to every member of Alcoholics Anonymous to accept a share of this responsibility. And how do we do it? Certainly not every member of AA can go back and meet with the board. My God, there wouldn't be room for the hundred and nearly 200,000 people to meet in one stadium, probably. And we wouldn't accomplish anything anyhow. So we delegate this to others within our group. We take a member of the group who is sincere and dedicated and willing to work and appoint him or her our GSR. And we give him or her our opinion on any question concerning AA as a whole. And we read the book, Alcoholics Anonymous Comes of Age, a complete history of Alcoholics Anonymous from its inception up through 1955 when Bill turned this thing over to us. And I find that the most exciting book I've ever read in my life. I've learned more about AA from that book than any other single source, I believe. And Bill has given us some very good advice for the future in that book. I'm not going to attempt to quote it to you. I, I don't know it that well. But I keep rereading it and finding new gems of wisdom that he's put down there for us to help guide us for the future. Among the things Bill has given us is the 12 concepts of world service. His best evaluation of what structure has gotten our world service to the point it is today and the structure that may help guide it in the future. 
primarily so that if we do make some mistakes and this thing falls away, we'll have a foundation to go back to to rebuild this structure that's so carefully and, and solidly been built up to now. And make no, no mistake, we're fallible human beings, we'll make mistakes, and we'll sometimes be carried away, and we'll do something that'll be a mistake, and we'll have to have some place to go back to to find out what's the right way to do it. Just as we individuals do, we make mistakes, and some of us have slips and get sick again. We have the book to come back to, the basic foundation of our personal recovery. We can start over and build our life correctly. And so it is with the group life and the traditions. And then so it is with world service and the 12 concepts. I find that instead of having just 12 steps for my program, I have 36. The 12 steps to recovery, the 12 traditions, and the 12 concepts of service. And I cannot do well without any one of them. No one of them is more important than another, but they all fit together to make a complete package. I know people down in our area who resisted, as many did, the 12 traditions. I got a hold of that 12 tradition thing as soon as uh, I'd started that Burbank group. About that time, the first 12 tradition pamphlet was published as, as a complete article which included these articles Bill had written in the grapevine. So I ordered enough of those for every member of the group, and I had a stack of them. Anytime someone new joined our group, they got a copy of the 12 traditions and with the announcement that, by golly, this group is going to be run by the voice of the group conscience. Now, we had meetings every Friday night. Once a month on a Thursday night, we had a business meeting. Every member of the group who was interested was invited to come to our hall and sit in on the business meeting so that that group would be conducted based on the desires of the group conscience. So at the first business meeting, as secretary and, and founder, naturally I presided at the meeting, uh, the meeting came to order, and I began to tell the folks assembled what the voice of the group conscience was. <laughs> You know, they really beat some AA sense into my head with those third legacy manuals. And I found that this is not uncommon. We uh, we go to a meeting, we pick up a handful of literature, and we rush out on a 12-step call and give this new baby this literature. And this new guy or gal comes to the meeting and, and appears to be making progress twice as fast as we did. And we're amazed. My God, what's happened? You know what happened? The newcomer read the literature. <laughs> All we did was pass it on. We didn't stop to read it. I've just finished rereading the whole bunch of our literature for about the tenth time. I keep copies of all the literature on a shelf by my bed, and frequently along with the book, and frequently I read it, and I'll, I'll make a project a reading every AA pamphlet, conference approved pamphlet we've got. And it's amazing. The new things I read in an old pamphlet, uh, my check on me, I think, of my willingness to have an open mind to accept new ideas, to understand maybe something that I read before and didn't understand. Just a couple of nights ago, I, I picked up the A book, as I frequently do, and just idly thumbed through and started reading, and I read a sentence in there that I swear has never been in that book before. But I looked, and it's, it's an old edition. I've had the book for ten years. It had to be there. But my blindness, mentally and, and visually, uh, didn't allow me to see it or to understand it. And so it goes. As I read the Third Legacy Manual, I finally studied it to where I believe I understand it. So what they do? They revised it. <laughs> Just when I had it down pat. Now there's a new AA service manual. I, gotta, I, I don't got to. I get to start all over and study a new piece of literature to try to learn better how to discharge my responsibility, my little bitty piece of it. Well, I've rambled on here some. I'm not sure that I've told you much about service. I've tried to, to share my personal experience with you. I don't believe I'm qualified to tell you what you should do in service. Bill has told us that service in AA is anything from a 10-cent phone call to a cup of coffee over the table to uh, whatever. 
that gets a recovered alcoholic face to face with a suffering drunk who wants help. The sum total of that is service. Well, general service is concerned primarily with those service items that no one group, certainly no one member, no one group, or no one area could adequately do by themselves. So we pool our interests and delegate to one central point the job of doing these things. So we have standard literature. We have uh, AA 12 steps around the world that you and I, many of us, never heard of. People who are sober because you and I help support the general service office. We wanted to help those who still suffered. 12 step calls that we couldn't possibly make. AA has been translated into many foreign languages. Some of the money we send to AA for group services is used in these foreign lands. A lot of them because in those, some of those foreign countries there are laws that prevent them sending money out of the country. They couldn't buy literature from our general service office because of their country's laws prohibiting them sending money out. So part of the funds we send goes to buy literature that could be sent free to those countries. We've helped some of those countries translate our book and literature into their own language so they can better understand it. All these things are part of general service that were done for years before most of us got sober, and we didn't know about it. Now we know about it. Now Bill has turned this thing over to us as of 1955 in St. Louis, after the five-year trial period of this third legacy plan. AA's future is in our hands, yours and mine, the members of Alcoholics Anonymous. How well we accept our individual responsibility, how well we delegate it to our GSRs and in turn the GSRs to the committee members and in turn the committee members to our delegates, that's how well AA is apt to survive. How much each of us as individuals keep tabs on what is happening. Call our GSRs occasionally for a, me a report at a meeting. Find out what is going on worldwide. We're definitely involved in it. It's not something we can close our eyes to. It's part of us, part of our program. I have to have all the help I can get. I cannot survive with part of an AA program. I have to have all of it. And all of the AA program entails general service as well as local and group service. I don't believe any group could survive for long if it closed its eyes to any local service, anything else. Our little group, we're going to have our meetings. To hell with you. We don't want no contributions to nothing. We're not interested in nobody but our own sobriety. First thing you know, you're going to have a bunch of drunks out there. That happened in the early days of AA. Groups would close their doors. They had rules and regulations. Uh, you had to practice... Uh, like going to the bank to borrow money. You had to prove you didn't need it before you could get it. <laughs> and uh, in the early days of AA, um, if you weren't a skid row bum, get out, Nellie. We're too busy for you. And that was almost the case when I came. I was 37 years old when I came here. I didn't consider myself especially young, but the members who were then active thought I was too young to be an alcoholic. And some of us have done the same thing to youngsters of 20 and 18, we said, oh, gee, how lucky you got here early before you were hurt. <laughs> Jesus. Isn't that a terrible thing to say to a person? I don't care if you're only seven years old. If you're hurting bad enough to look up AA, by God, you've had it. <laughs> <laughs> and... <laughs> So, at 37, I was considered too young for AA by the then members. Some of those same members now say I'm too old. <laughs> well, I, I passed my 60th birthday last May. I feel better than I did when I came in here at 37. Uh, I, oh, I know I look better, uh, as bad as I look. And I'm younger than I was 23 and a half years ago. 
And it's because of the new life this program has given me, the interest that I've been able to keep. I read articles in the grapevine uh, on the subject of how to keep the old-timer interested. <laughs> now, I don't know what old-timers they're talking about. Uh, in point of years, uh, I guess I'm an old-timer. I've been around here quite a while. Uh, I'm more interested today in what goes on in AA than I was in the beginning, because I know more about it now, and it's a vital living thing, and it's part of my life. And without it, I don't have life. Without you, I don't have life. And without me, you don't have life. We need each other. We desperately need each other. And AA needs every one of us. Now, it doesn't take much of a man to make AA, but it takes all of you. Often quoted phrase, like most everything I've had to say today, nothing really has been new, nothing has been uh, of my uh, origin. I borrowed it somewhere. Somewhere it has seemed to fit. Uh, I think it's time I shut up. I'm starting to bore myself a little now. <laughs> and I know that uh, there's so much more I could and would like to tell you about the workings of the General Service Conference, for example. It was my privilege to be delegate from our area in 1963 and 64. At the same time, Bill G. was your delegate from Northern Coastal. Uh, Bill and I were probably the two best delegates at the conference, <laughs> in our opinion. Uh, all I can tell you about that first conference is that, unbeknownst to us newer delegates, there's a, there's a panel kind of looking over everybody, and at the last meeting of the conference, they select the man delegate and the woman delegate who have contributed most to that particular conference, and they are presented in a book autographed by Bill, just as a thank you thing, because they help most. I was presented a special award, a pair of boxing gloves. <laughs> Every subject that came on the floor, I had to get up and tell them what was right about it. I was the authority. I knew all. And I thought, as a delegate, it was my responsibility to speak my opinion on every subject. And I think the words were when they presented the gloves to protect his hands when he reaches for the mic. <laughs> a mic hog. So I brought those boxing gloves home and showed them to my assembly. And they said I could keep them. I had earned them. So they're mine. So I have them hanging on the wall in my bedroom. My lack of modesty permits me to tell you that the following year, uh, I was presented a book. And, uh, gee, i got a crack at my voice. I'm about to cry. <laughs> Wonderful. I haven't grown up so much that I can talk about things without feeling an emotional uh, lift. What a wonderful experience. An alcoholic who has been given life again. Many of us are fond of saying I'm grateful, member of AA. Some say I'm glad I'm an alcoholic. I'm so grateful that somebody had done the necessary work to have AA here when I wanted and needed it. And if I, uh, if I could sum this up in my own words, I would, but I can't. And I've got a little story I want to share with you that sums up my total feeling better than any words of mine I could ever think of. I want to share that with you. The story has to do with uh, oh, a very expensive, beautiful subdivision over here somewhere. Beautiful homes, gorgeous lawns, a very exclusive neighborhood, except on one prominent corner, there's a vacant lot. And there's an absentee owner, and as a result, weeds have grown up. Trash is blown in there, rusty cans and empty bottles, and it's an eyesore to the neighborhood. And one day, one of the fellows down the block decided he's going to do something about it. And he loaded up a wheelbarrow full of tools and went down to that corner, and he chopped those weeds, and he hauled trash, and he leveled off that lot. And he planted grass there, and he tended it carefully. And then he put in some flowers. And after a lot of months of hard work, 
That former eyesore corner was a beautiful park-like setting, a real credit to the neighborhood. And one day he's down there watering the lawn or something, and the little parish priest comes strolling by, and he stopped to admire this, and he said to the man, this, what a beautiful setting. Isn't it wonderful what the power of God can do? And the guy says, yeah, but you should have seen this corner when he had it alone. <laughs> and I think so it is with each of us. I'm convinced that all my life God has tried to help me, but I wasn't helping him. But now I am. And uh, as the book suggests, I think... Uh, that I have tried to clear away some of the wreckage of the past, and I've tried to give freely of what I thought. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.